are the problems and the credits that come from every area. He helps me bargain on Packer agreements. So I want Ron to give you a, a brief rundown when we're through here. Then I hope that these men have left you with enough questions in your mind about what we're going to do and what we are doing that we can wind this out with a question and answer type panel. And I definitely think that you've got to participate. I don't think that any of you come in here without any questions in your mind on slaughter cattle. So Ron, if you don't mind, would you want to stand up and give them a rundown? I'll try to be as brief as possible. I think because probably it is the aspect that I'm involved in in cattle, I think probably the thing that I want you to carry back home would be motivation among the membership to participate, to take an active part. One of the things that I've seen in the year that I've been in the home office is a dependence on the people in the country, on the people, the staff, and the, and the leadership. There seems to be a general attitude that I'm a member of this organization, therefore I want you to give me something. I'm paying check off on my cattle. I want service in return. You're going to get that service, but this is a member's organization. This is your organization. And each local area has to take care of their own problems. We can assist you, but we can't assist you if we don't know the specifics of the problems. There are not enough of us here to cover the entire country. There is not enough money in the United States to completely saturate this country with representatives. It's your organization. You can keep your check off cheap. You can keep your costs down by doing the work yourself. It'll help you be informed and you'll be more in touch with what's going on specifically in your area. One of the problems we run into almost every day is that people will come to us, and members specifically, they'll say, well, I can sell my cow to this cattle jockey down the road. He'll give me cash, or he'll, he'll give me a little better price. I can go down to the sale barn and get a little more money. Most of the people in this, in this room I recognize as being informed about this. But one aspect I think you should carry home to them is that when we sell a cow, or a block of cows for, as an example, 45 cents on a live basis, we have locked in that price. We have bulled the market to 45 cents. When you take that same bunch of cows and market them in the open market for 44 cents, you're going to come out with more money in your pocket as an individual on that cow or that group of cows but you have put a bearish effect into the market in that by selling those cows and putting that dollars in your pocket, you've put the market from 45 cents to 44 cents and you've, you've taken the air out of it. You're holding your own markets down. These are the things that concern me, cooperation among the membership. We're right now in a position in agricultural because of the activity generated by the American agricultural movement as a legislative body and as a public representative, they've made a lot of noise. They've done a lot of good. They've made the consumer aware of the problems in agriculture with pricing. They have diverted that consumer and informed him, educated him to the point where he, the resistance from the consumer is minimal at this point. They're prepared to pay higher price for their food. They're paying more for their oil and they think that the oil industry is conning them. They're paying more for their food, but they don't believe that you're conning them. I think that we need to go back out into the country with an attitude of total cooperation with the other farm organizations. They are an asset to us. We offer something exclusive to this organization, and that is a marketing service. This is not a marketing organization. 
It is a bargaining organization. But in order to bargain, you have to have something to market. Because what you're bargaining for is what you're planning to market. I think we need to carry that back out there. So first of all, I want you to inform the producers, keep them informed, and make them participate. Make them be a functioning part of what's going on. Because it is, they are going to reap the harvest, not the staff in Corning. Secondly, I think that we should have an, a cooperation with the other farm organizations. And of course, last, I think that each one of you guys as leaders should get out there and get after it. Not sit around and wait for something to happen. Don't sit around and cry in your milk because everything's not going good. We've got a lot of, we have a lot of weak areas, but the potential is there. Capitalize on every positive thing that happened. Take a positive attitude away from this convention. Now, I came with the National Farmer Organization about a year ago, and I made considerably more money than I'm making working for the farmers. But I saw something in agriculture that I haven't seen any place else. I saw a marketing system that's atrocious. The oil companies don't let you take the gas and then let you determine what you're going to pay for it. Nobody does. And I don't have to go into detail to explain that atrocity. You guys are in a world of your own in agriculture. The time is coming when that's going to change. Corporate industry is consuming you. Young people like myself and Steve Bohr aren't going to sit around for the next 20 years while you guys gripe and complain and, and cry in your milk. We're just not going to do it because we're positive people and we're going to go out and make it work. If we can't work it through the National Farmers Organization, then probably not us, but someone else like us will work it from the other end. They're doing it now. The Farm Bureau is trying to set up a market service for cattle in Iowa. They've sold some cattle. The American Agricultural Movement last week announced that they are going to analyze the possibilities of going into a marketing service. You are right now 20 years ahead of every, every other agricultural group of any kind in the country with your marketing service. You're going to have to act fast because time is running out. It's not going to happen complaining. And it's not going to happen if you depend on me to do it. It's only going to happen if you get out there and stay with it. If you take a positive attitude instead of the old, the old fist. You remember that from the 60s? When I was in college, that was the sign for everything. Power. Farm power is what we're preaching this time. We want a positive farm power. We don't want a forceful farm power. We want power through intelligence, through smart marketing, through smart organizing. National, that's everybody. Farmers, that's a specific type of people. And it is an organization. Organize it. I'd like to open the floor to questions. Anybody's got one to ask me? Or do you want to just... Why don't we go on to the non-associate and then they can come back to the individual? Okay. Thanks for your time. I think that... I think that when you... When I hear uh, individuals like Ron Shaw and I sit and I hear Ron and I look out at people considerably more tenure in this organization than he has. I think that you specifically as delegates have got to be two things. You got to be impressed with the type people that are governing the slaughter cattle. But you got to be ashamed also, because I sat here and heard him tell you just now, and I've never heard that before, but I heard him tell you more 
in six, seven, eight minutes than I heard for 15 years as far as positivity is concerned coming from this organization. I think that you've got to do, as Ron has said, I think you have got to put your attitude in the right context. Now, people get well hung up on attitudes, and I think that's wrong, too, because when you're trying to get your head straight, you're losing production, as far as I'm concerned. So I'd say, as you're going down to get production, get your attitude right. I missed a man from Michigan that does the coordinating for the Slaughter Cattle Division. I don't, I just saw Dale Bullen. Would you stand up, Dale? I apologize. If you were sitting here, I missed you when I was introducing the fellas. Dale is from Michigan. Dale does specifically what these other coordinators, supervisors do for the Slaughter Cattle Division in other areas. Dale's as valuable as all of them are. Dale's got cows going this morning out of Michigan at 90 cents a pound. That'll give you an indication of what he's doing in the state of Michigan. Have I missed it? Steve, have I missed any of our, I don't see another, right there. Harry, you want to stand up? This is Harry DeVos from Ghent, Minnesota, runs the Ghent, Minnesota Collection Point. Now, Harry isn't a state supervisor, but I'll tell you what Harry DeVos does. Harry DeVos does exactly what Ron Shaw was discussing. I don't know how many cattle he'll block in a year's time or a month's time. It's, it's phenomenal. And he does it with one method. That's a positive, constructive contact with the membership, whether they're members or actually non-members, whether they're participants or non-participants. He puts the results of the program up in front of those people in Minnesota, southwestern Minnesota area. And it's phenomenal what he blocks and runs through that Ghent, Minnesota collection point. He is probably a premier example of what every collection point should do. And I'm going to suggest to you that if you got questions on how to make a collection point work, that when you when we get to the question answer end of this thing, you talk to Harry or ask Harry questions. You talk to Erwin Stry because he does sim the same thing in southwestern Wisconsin in those points. These are the people that you have absolutely got to groom and motivate and educate in those areas are the people that run those points because if, if, if we don't have them, We've lost one tooth off of the gear, and it really hurts. So keep that in mind as we progress here this morning. Now, Gerald Cox is from Monta Vista. Like I said, only been with this organization three months, roughly. Is that right, Gerald? It's just about three months. Um, I will say this. As a buyer, as I was a buyer for a hundred years, and as Gerald has been our cattle buyer, Ron Shaw made a distinction that I don't know if it meant much to you folks, but it's been a heck of a transition for me and I'm sure Gerald to make. It's that transition between marketing and bargaining. Half the time when I'm talking to people, I'll be talking about buying cattle. And so will Gerald for a while, I'm sure. Well, we, we don't mean that. We mean selling and we mean bargaining, but we're talking about buying cattle all the time. And it's quite a transition to come out of the industry and come into a bargaining association or organization as this is. So you're going to have to be patient with people like Gerald and I for a while until we get our feet on the ground. So Gerald, you want to say some words? Thank you, Walt. I'll tell you, it's kind of hard to get up after Walt and uh, Ron and say anything that means anything. 
that that we could put any more force in it. Uh, I've been a Packer buyer for seven years, and uh, all I can say is we need production in order to not sell your cattle, market your cattle for you. And if we can get the backing from the points, we can do this. If we don't get the cattle, it's hard to go to a buyer, a packer buyer, and, and try to sell him something that you don't have. It's hard to sell him something that you think you might get someday. And uh, what we need is we need to get together. We need to block this production. We can sell it if we can get it. We, now, I've been on the end of... Uh, I don't know, I guess they call them scalpers around here where you go out and you're one against one and and trying to buy these cattle out in the country and make the packer all the money you can and uh, get paid pretty well for that. But we're on the other end now. We're here to do you a job and, and there's not only me, there's the staff, there's a lot of people in the field that can do it now that has the, uh, I don't know if it's experience or Knox or, or what you would call it, but I believe we can sell your cattle if you'll give them to us to sell. And I think we can bargain with the packer, the same ones that we were uh, buying for, that the same ones that we were in competition with before. I think we can do a job now. All I would like to stress is please give us the production. We will sell it for you. And uh, all I am is a representative of cattle. I don't know much about uh, selling these cattle, but we do have the people here with... Uh, with Ron and with Steve and, and Walt backing them. And just please give us the production. If there's any way we can help you, we'll do it. But we need production to do anything. Thank you. Gerald, uh, went, I'm sure, for the first time in his life about... Uh, six weeks ago probably now he went over to Pueblo Colorado and the new packer opened up down there we needed the outlet we needed that packer he went into Pueblo and bargained a contract for this organization and it's a darn good one he did it without any help he had never seen a par contract bargained for or an agreement, but with practically no prior coaching at all, Gerald knew because of his experience as a buyer, he knew what fair market was compared to underselling and so forth. And with that kind of knowledge, he simply went into that packer and bargained a, an agreement for the organization. Now, I don't, I know I probably couldn't have done that myself as he did it. I'm not particularly sure yet, except that he may or may not have had an excellent rapport. I think he had to have had an excellent prior rapport with that packer, even though he didn't work for him as a cattle buyer because he obviously had their respect and he went in there in Pueblo and got a contract. A week or so ago, he went to his prior employers in Albuquerque and got another one with Carla for the southwestern area out there. Now, of course, those primarily are co-cow agreements, you understand, but they also include slaughter cattle and finished cattle uh, fed cattle for us down there too. And they're excellent agreements. In fact, the one in Albuquerque, and maybe this will roll over your head, it shouldn't, but you know there's different bases of pricing across the United States. You have the national provisioner in the Midwest, so to speak. You have the Amar Amarillo meat wire in the Southwest. You have the West Coast wire invariably those will become progressively higher as you work your way west. I don't know a accurate example, but for instance, 84 cent steers here today could be 85, five and a half in Amarillo, could be 86 or 87 or seven and a half in California. When he went into the Albuquerque 
Packer, Carla, I assumed that he had probably come out of there with an Amarillo meat wire. Well, he'd come out of there with a West Coast meat wire. Was the basis for pricing cattle at that, mid, at that Southwestern Packer. Things like that, little simple movements, maneuvers like that, are vital to selling cattle. An average guy that has had no prior experience in marketing would have overlooked those things. But they're not being overlooked for you now in your organization. There's areas that's soft, and we recognize it. We have soft agreements in areas, and we recognize it. And I'm almost tired of preaching that in order to firm those soft agreement areas up, it requires volume. But ladies and gentlemen, it is that simple. You got to have something in order to attract attention for a better agreement. So in the areas we consider as soft areas, well, we recognize them. We got areas, we got contracts or agreements, I call them, that I don't think are worth the powder to blow them to hell. But we got them because it happens to be as good as we can get in that area because of the volume we have in that area. So these are things that you've got to impress on the membership when you're visiting here in the convention between now and the close, and when you get home and you're expected to make some sort of a report on what came out of these type delegate commodity meetings, you've got to retain these things. Like Ron said, it is physically impossible for us to cover this country. We can't do it. You've got to help us. We've got to have your assistance out there. It's an appeal from me. Ron put it on a matter of being effective. It's an appeal. You've got right now, and I'm not going to spend five minutes bragging about what y'all have, except I want you to know that this morning you got, and last week, and this morning, for one thing, you've got the highest price ever paid in the history of the packing industry on cull cows in this organization for openers. Now, I don't need to hear what cows are selling for. I don't care because I know that we got more because we got the highest price ever paid. You got talented people that are running this program for you. I'm not including myself. I'm including people that you're going to hear from this Thursday, and I said it's going to knock your eyes out. It is going to. I made a comment to these men when we made this decision on the direction our commodity reports were going to take at this convention. I made a, I made a comment that we are in no longer a position to impress anybody. We don't have to. I don't have to. These men don't have to impress one soul anymore. They got the best there is as a marketing program for you as membership and this organization. It's just that simple. Steve Bohr will expound on that Thursday. It's, it's as a packer and as a not a hundred ahead jobber down the road, but as a packer that killed 40, 45,000 head of cattle a week and I was responsible for buying them all. It's phenomenal to me what these men have been able to do for you and for your membership that you're representing here. It's phenomenal. Do you know that them cows at 90 cents a pound this morning do you know that 20, 25% of them cows are probably $17, Erwin, correct me, over the market? A hundredweight. I'm probably exaggerating, but I'm close. Erwin, how far, how far off am I? What are our breakers worth today? Well, then I was considerate to you. We're, we're $19.50 over the market. A breaker cow by herself is worth 70 and a half and she sold at 90. How much more do you want? I'm going to tell you what you're not going to get, and I've said this before. 
you're not going to get my blood. And you're not going to get these men's blood. But you can get everything else. You've got 19 and a half over the market. I don't, I don't know where the end of it is. It's, it's, it's uh, right at this time. It's, uh, we all know it's a high altitude. It's thin air. Breathing's getting tough. If this thing continues, something's going to happen. I suppose Carter's going to come out and drop an eggshell in your hip pocket. But until he does, we're going to take advantage of this situation. And we're going to do it because of the efforts of people like you've seen introduced here today, specifically, and only, because these men have got the power to motivate. Without motivation and without member participation, then naturally, you haven't got a thing. You haven't got one cotton-picking thing to talk about. But you have all of that now. And it is your, specifically your, responsibility to be sure that these thoughts and these expressions that are, that are talked about here today are accurately and totally expressed to that membership when you go home. You got no reason to back up to the pay window anymore. You got no reason to stand there with your hat in your hand, your head down, kicking a cow turd, trying to apologize for a cattle program. You don't have to. You're in position to roll, and you're going to hear how we're rolling. You're going to hear why we roll in the directions we have, and you're going to hear specifically what you do have in that general meeting this Thursday. I want you to hear from Joe Sohn from Wisconsin. As I said before, Joe was involved in the National Farmers Organization. Uh, I'm sure, knowing Joe as I know him now, as a interested member, as a good member, or all those good adjectives that you want to put on an NFO participant. But he came down to Corning, Iowa last winter, and I'll never forget him. He came in there as cocky as a rooster, and he was asking a lot of stupid questions and making a lot of dumb mistakes, and I tried to be as uh, sympathetic as I could with him, ended up hiring him. And he's proven out to be probably more effective than I thought was possible. <clears throat> when he went back to Wisconsin, he had the excellent cooperation of Erwin Stry and uh, Vic Balmer down in Rock County, Wisconsin. And they've helped bring Joe along. They recognize his youth and vitality and interest and experience he's gained now. He makes a lot of mistakes, but he makes a lot of good moves up there that override him, and he'll make fewer mistakes as we go. I want you to hear from Joe. He probably won't have much to say, and what he says probably screwed up. <laughs> but I want you to hear from him, because he's a good man, and he's representing you out there, and it's people like that that's going to make this thing work. You know... Uh Walt has used all these good adjectives on me. He's just got one problem. He don't understand people from Wisconsin. That's his problem. He don't understand that the old Okies ain't as smart as us people up north. We won the war. But uh, there's only two things I think that I would like you guys or you people to take back to your home states and your home counties. One is total communication. You've got to go out in the country and talk to your non-member and your member neighbors. And you've got to get their production. We ain't effective with one cow in Wisconsin. But you take a thousand cows and we get 90 cents. The second thing I'd like to have you take back is teamwork. Just work together. 
I think of our organization as a football team. We have no longer got, and I hate to use this term, little NFOs. I didn't want to use National Farmers Organization, okay? But we've now got one big National Farmers Organization in Wisconsin in our cattle division. Erlen works with me. <clears throat> All of the collection points, collection point people work with me. This is what I call teamwork. I ain't nothing without them. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. <clears throat> I, want to, I want to explain what uh, Joe commented about when he said, uh, turned around to me and, and, and talked about NFO. You know, I got a hang up that I don't know. You can kick it around in your own mind. Everyone is totally welcome to their opinion on how they talk. But I'm going to tell you, as an ex-packer industry, so forth, you know, I don't know if it affects me like it does potential membership or like it might affect some people out there, the people with their head down apologizing that I referred to. You know, I had a guy yesterday tell me this, which kind of tends to verify my thinking. He said, you know, I don't think I like the NFO too well. But he said, you want to know something? That National Farmers Organization is getting to be a hell of an outfit. <laughs> you think about that for a minute. You know, I don't know particularly what his thoughts were. But I know what NFO means to Walt Hackney. It means a bobtail truck full of strikers with hammers and clubs and knocking my windows out of my company car when I was a cattle buyer for Iowa Beef Packers. <laughs> but the National Farmers Organization to me means a vital and viable organization that has gotten themselves into the position of having a super handle on the marketing specifically, of course, of cattle across this country. They're recognized and appreciated and respected by every packer that I know of that we are willing to do business with. And you know, that right there is quite a switch because it hasn't been too long ago. Y'all would pretty near take hold of any packer that it would let you. And today, we decide who we do business with because we have the opportunity through their request to do business with all of them if we want to. And we don't want to. But I think that's something you want to think about when you go home. What, how does NFO hit you? How does National Farmers Organization hit you? Well, all Joe was talking about is that I have made a concentrated effort that when I'm talking about this organization, I'm talking about the National Farmers Organization, not the NFO. And so that's what he was referring to. The other fellow here is Don M. Sandy. Don's from Billings, Montana. I don't know Don probably as well as a lot of people in this room. I'll tell you why. Um, Don and I never worked very closely together up till the last, oh, f five or six months when I kind of inherited the area Don's in in Montana and on out on the West Coast. But I can tell you this, Don works equal between slaughter cattle and the feeder cattle division. And Dave Miller, who's the director of the feeder cattle division, has got the same opinion of Don M. Sandy as I have. Dave's comment to me is as they've just recently wound up an enormous amount of deliveries in the state of Montana, that he absolutely, in no way, could have taken delivery, nor have coordinated, nor have gotten anything done, actually, on that delivery of feeder cattle in the state of Montana without the express help 
of Don M. Sandy and Joyce Riles, who works very closely up there with Don. Don's got a good ability in the country. I rode with him back last fall when I was there, and I know Don has an excellent ability to accurately describe and evaluate cattle on a hoof basis. I know that Packers respect and appreciate and will take his description of those cattle when they're described into them packing houses. And it's people like that that will slowly but methodically build this program as we pursue it on West. I want you to hear from Don now. I don't think Don, I don't think Don expected to talk here today, but I can tell you what he's got to say concerning his area will definitely be of betterment to this organization. And what he says about Montana will fit Missouri or it'll fit any other state in this country. So Don. I listened to Joe here a minute ago. He said uh, one cow don't do Wisconsin no good. Who the hell does one cow do anybody any good? Takes a few more than that to get started in cow business or slaughter business or wherever you go, you need production and you need volume. Uh, I think probably volume is the biggest thing you hear about today in any business. You have to have volume. Small businesses or farms or ranches or whatever you have has got to be managed according to a larger volume to make it very productive or to make uh, it financially stable so that you can uh, operate at a profit. And of course that's what everybody wants anyhow is a profit out of their business. So uh, I think Don and Marion there, they uh, cover lots of country. We got a little bigger state than a lot of you people have. And uh, it takes quite a little traveling to get around and handle the operation. And uh, some, some days you're uh, driving 16, 18 hours a day and don't get too far either. But with people like that, why uh, we get part of the job done anyhow. And with the rest of the help, why I'm sure we'll get some more done in the future. Thank you. I may have. I may or may not have uh, failed to say, I don't know, Don is also a uh, plant representative for us there in Glasgow, Montana, and also at the uh, Stanko plant, and then also over Billings at the Midland Packing Company up there. Um, interesting sidelight on Don that I didn't know yesterday. I was visiting with him, and I said, how are you getting along that new plant in Glasgow? I'd never been there. We made a contractor and agreement up there. And, and I hadn't had a chance to get into the plant. And Don said, well, he said, you don't <clears throat> go over there. And he said, look, uh, I think he was referring to week before last. He had 200 and some cows in there. He said, you know, it gets boring sitting around that thing all day long, one cow at a time, waiting in there, tagging or checking the back tags and so forth. So he said, I just, I just, uh, I knock all of the National Farmers Organization's livestock, myself personally, just make sure to get them dead. And he physically knocks the cattle in the plant. So there's another thing, you know, you don't necessarily do in a packing house unless you got a pretty good rapport with whoever's running that gin mill. So this is the kind of relationship I'm hunting for. When I asked for help last fall in those young farmer meetings, and when I came to the different areas last winter, I asked for help. This is what I'm looking for. The people that you met here, as the two gentlemen from Montana, and Irvin, and Dale Bullen, and Mr. De Mr. DeVos, these are the people we have got to have. And that's the important thing I want to emphasize to you right now. When you go home, you know, you heard how drastically we've got to have the proper kind of clientele out there. We've got to have these men that have an astute ability to be cattlemen. You know what I'm looking for. You've heard some of them. You've met some of them here. You know what we've got to have. Age is 100% immaterial. Harry DeVos, 150 years old, and he can do more work than Ron Shaw. 
and he can do it probably better when it's on a one-to-one -one basis with a rural farmer that's got cattle. He's got that natural knack to glean confidence out of that member into Harry and let Harry market these cattle as he sees fit. But those are the kind of people I've got to have. And when you go home, that's the kind of people I would hope that you suggest back to us in the home office as potential employees of this organization because they're going to be your people. You're either going to reap the harvest or stand there and watch it hailed out if the guy don't work. So be careful who you recommend. Steve Bohr was a plant rep when I came with this organization back a year ago. <clears throat> he was over in Omaha. <clears throat> in fact, I think he was up somewhere north and we transferred him to Omaha. Isn't that right, Steve? I've really forgotten. There's been so much water under the bridge in a year that uh, Steve went into Omaha as a plant rep, but all the time I'm sitting there in them young farmer meetings searching for people that will do us the right kind of a job. And I recognized in Steve, as I have in these other fellows, a talent that needed to be expanded upon. He had a good thing going for him in a way was his age, and then of course in another way it isn't good because a young man has got a definite challenge ahead of him dealing with the average cattle feeder in this country because of that age differential. And it's a tough job for Steve knowing all he knows, knowing everything he knows on how to trade for cattle. It's tough for him to get the confidence of that older fellow that he's doing business for because the guy probably talking to Steve's got a boy at home older and that makes it tough but I'm going to tell you what he can do he can do the same as any young man going he can trade your socks off or he can trade off the socks of a packer for you if you just give him the chance he's getting better every day too as he trades I needed a guy over in Corning <clears throat> to help me bargain I needed someone that had a pretty good uh, opinion on plant representation, which I absolutely did not and probably still don't have. I needed help in that area, and I asked Steve if he would come over and, of course, start out slow, uh, teach me about some areas, and I'd help him and others, and it's worked out pretty well. I'm proud of Steve, and I'm proud of what his potential is if you all give him the proper opportunity. But he can't learn much in there trading on that one cow that Don and these fellows are talking about. But he, learn, he learns a lot trading on thousand head blocks. And we've been trading on thousand head blocks. And it works and he's learning, all these men are learning. But most importantly, y'all are learning that it works for you. And that's the important thing. Steve? If you wouldn't mind, Walt, I'd like to sit down and listen to that again, would you? <laughs> That's all you're going to hear out of me. <laughs> a couple people that I noticed that we missed. Clarence Weber is here from Humboldt in South Dakota. Stand up, Clarence. Stand up there, Clarence, would you? Clarence runs a collection point there at Humboldt. And just outside the door, a gal that's a plant representative for us, in California. Sandy? Maybe she's not there anymore. There she is. Sandy, Sandy Wilson. She's a plant rep in uh, Tulare, California. Dwayne Wind was right there, but I think he left. He was hiding back in the corner. I think maybe the crotch was ripped out of his pants or something. He wouldn't step out in the open. this meeting today, the people sitting up here are probably going to get more out of it than what you will. About three weeks ago, I was in Jerome, Idaho. That area 
has completely fallen apart and not necessarily the fault of the membership. When I went out there to that meeting, I had a lot of difficulty in trying to figure out what I was going to tell those people. They had about 30 people show up at that meeting and I introduced myself and backed up against the wall and told them to go ahead and start wherever they wanted to. It turned out they kept me there till 1 o'clock in the morning. And I think it was probably one of the best meetings I've ever attended. Those people went through the problems that they did have and also come up with answers to solve them.